Okay, so it's a pleasure to introduce you, Francesco Di Cintio. He uh, was a student here in Bologna. He graduated in 2009 with the work on the relaxation, and uh, I hope you are relaxed. Pretty much. And then uh, he was, uh, he did his PhD in Dresden on the Max Planck Institute for Physics of Complex Systems. Then he was postdoc in different places, Italy, France, uh, etc. And now he's a, he's a permanent researcher at Florence, the, the CNR Institute for Complex Systems, and I think affiliated uh, in it. Yes. So, and today we'll talk about uh, the collapse and Okay, thank, so you. thank you very much, Luca, for the introduction, for inviting me here. It's a pleasure being here, sort of back to the origins, even though the place is not the same. So in my talk, I will be discussing some numerical simulations of um, collapse, dissipation as collapse, and its implication in the alleged uh, dynamical mass versus, uh, uh, versus stellar mass to flattening relation. So if on one hand, a lot of things, a lot of studies have been devoted to the uh, correlation between the um, central increase or decay of the dark matter distribution and uh, the stellar profile, much less is known how much the amount of um, dark to luminous mass is related to the flattening of the spheroids such as uh, elliptical galaxies. So in a series of paper uh, by Deo and uh, collaborators, now they made this um, claim that um, the um, total dynamical mass, or better, the mass to light ratio measured uh, in solar luminosities, has this um, quasi-linear trend with uh, the ellipticity, with the intrinsic uh, ellipticity of, uh, of a spheroid, where uh, the, in the assumption of oblateness, of, um, of a given elliptical galaxies, the, uh, the intrinsic ellipsis is re recovered, uh, inverting this relation between the, the apparent uh, ellipticity projected on the sky plane. Uh, and if you rewrite uh, the equation above here in terms of uh, Newtonian total mass versus ellipticity, you have that within normalization, four times the total mass, so dark plus uh, stellar in the context of Newtonian gravity and lambda CDM over stellar mass, scaled as uh, 14 times the, um, the ellipticity. And to, uh, to, to derive the relation, they, they did a broad study you know, with, the, with different uh, and independent measures of the, of the mass to light ratio, limiting to medium sized galaxies with um, 10 to the 8 solar mass up to 10 to the 11, and uh, typically undisturbed galaxies. Both criteria are relaxed if you go to distant galaxies at high redshift. And typically, the, the original sample of 237 galaxies studied uh, in the observational papers it rejected uh, the compact ellipticals at all possible sorts of active galaxies and peculiar galaxies such as irregulars or high sigma galaxies at large set in order to exclude, for example, the S zeros. All right, and um, as I mentioned before, the uh, the mass to light ratio is evaluated with uh, several uh, protocols. So you're applying the, the theory theorem, which stellar dynamics model applies to the inferred uh, 3D structure of the observed galaxies from the X-ray emission, and also from planetary nebula and globular cluster dynamics, as well as dust disk dynamics, or even uh, in the more recent surveys from gravitational density. So here we have an example of how the uh, um, empirical linear relation between the mass to light ratio and the apparent and here intrinsic ellipticity looks like when uh, when expressed in the in terms of uh, of um, observed quantities from the from the different surveys. So here we have uh, VIRA theorem calculations here uh, lensing. Uh, stellar orbit models or gas disk dynamics. So these are more recent uh, results, just showing the scatter of the aforementioned relations, and uh, uh, a more recent um, 
appearing here last year in this paper from Winters and collaborator, a set of data using a broader um, a broader set uh, of galaxies where some of the aforementioned criteria were relaxed. And you see that at least here and here, the scatter uh, increments. OK, so um, this, if true, of course, if we, if we take this thing for granted, this has quite a few astrophysical implication in both uh, the standard non cdm scenario and also in modified Newtonian dynamics and so on. So this could be interpreted in lambda CDM as more dark matter. So the larger is the, the, the dark fraction of the uh, amount of the bulk of the mass of the galaxy. And the larger is the departure from the, uh, the spherical symmetry, which might sound a bit counterintuitive at first. And uh, this could also be uh, interpreted as more massive halos are less spherical, and therefore the flattening of the stellar component is uh, a direct consequence of the flattening of the embedding uh, dark matter halo. And from the point of view of uh, modifying Newtonian dynamics, where the standard uh, Poisson equation is substituted with uh, this uh, nonlinear Poisson, this would imply that larger spheroids uh, depart more from, uh, from spherical symmetry. So far, um, in uh, numeric, from the point of view of uh, modeling and numerical simulation, so up to now, this co correlation between the, the total dynamical mass to stellar mass versus skepticity hasn't been looked at much in, uh, in numerical simulations. So in a series of, uh, of, of works uh, I've been involved in, I'm looking exactly at how uh, a simple model of dissipation less collapse with the different uh, types of uh, initial condition could, uh, in principle, produce uh, end products by, uh, by relaxation and phase mixing that uh, reproduce this uh, relation between the total dynamical mass and uh, the flattening of the end states of the simulations. So I have been performing a Newtonian and body simulation with a standard um, uh, and body code with a typical tree code uh, Barnesat model, and also uh, particle mesh simulations in modified Newtonian dynamics using NMODI, which is a nonlinear Poisson solver uh, developed here by Carlo and collaborators. And in all, um, in all uh, numerical simulation, as a rule, I'm, I'm always assuming that for the stellar component, the, the mass to light ratio is one. I'm taking isolated and rather cold initial conditions, so the initial period ratio is always smaller than 0.1. And uh, for the Newtonian simulations, uh, I'm assuming both live or frozen halos. So live halo, it's also the distribution of dark matter is involved. Frozen halo, you take a model, NFW or gamma model, you freeze it, and then you keep it as an external fixed potential. And uh, two, essentially two types of initial conditions, uh, perfectly spherical or uh, clumpy. And uh, in MOND, the situation is a bit trickier because there you don't have dark matter. And what I am uh, considering as total dynamical mass of the system is uh, the total mass that one would infer interpreting the, the Mond system as a Newtonian system plus dark matter. Typically, Mond systems are characterized by this dimensionless uh, kappa parameter, which is g times the stellar mass over uh, uh, scale radius to the power of 2 times the uh, A0, which is the scale acceleration of Mond. So the larger is this. Um, the larger is this uh, number here, and the closest is the model to the Newtonian regime, vice versa. The smallest, the larger is the uh, mod difference. I've also experimented a bit with uh, spherical and single, uh, sp spherical single or multi component uh, radially anisotropic equilibria in both uh, Newton and mod. As I was mentioning, bond models, the dynamical mass is estimated from the angle averaged uh, final state uh, simply assuming that it's a spherical system, and I can use this relation to the Newtonian and Mond force in uh, spherical symmetry. So this is just a sketch of how the uh, initial condition looked like in the clumpy case and in the vertically spherical. OK, so the first thing one has to look at is 
one is observed. So I'm interpreting the end states of the simulations as observed objects, and I take a, a number of uh, projections on the 2D plane, and I compute the 2D ellipticity, and then inverting this, assuming that the um, that the uh, fake observed uh, elliptical galaxy is oblate, therefore I can uh, invert this relation between, between the 2D ellipticity uh, measured as one minus the minimum to major uh, semi-axis and uh, extract the positive intrinsic uh, 3D ellipticity. So here the, the, the yellow shaded area and the dashed lines are the Bayeran collaborators relation and different symbol uh, refer to different uh, simulations. So Newtonian with frozen halo, Newtonian with live uh, live halo, and diamonds uh, mon system with only baryonic matter. And then as you see, uh, if on one hand there is a trend of uh, increasing ellipticity in both 2D and 3D with increasing uh, dynamical mass to uh, stellar mass, um, the uh, the supposed linear relation is uh, not at all uh, reproduced. So on one hand, at least for a range of mass ratios, it looks like there is some increasing trend. On the other, this uh, linear relation is not recovered. Okay, so now I made a in a little parenthesis, so there has been other um, observation on the theoretical studies by Tinker and collaborator and Sonnenfeld uh, 2019, which uh, evidence that there is a correlation between the halo mass, the stellar mass, and the surcage index M in the projected uh, density profile of observed uh, galaxies. So this is quite uh, interesting because it's also related to um, the mass ratio versus ellipticity relation in a sense that the surface index is something you can easily compute from the, the 2D projection of uh, the end states of numerical simulations and uh, can be uh, easily uh, compared with uh, their relation between the surface index and uh, total mass over uh, stellar mass and therefore deriving a correlation between uh, the two. And again, here, um, they found that for, for these spheroids, the, the, the surface index is proportional to the stellar mass up to the, to the 0 0.46 uh, power. And um, also that the, in this range of masses, the, the dark mass, it's uh, proportional to the stellar mass of the 1.7. So one can figure that this uh, search exchange should be proportional to this ratio here, m to m star minus 1 to the 6.6, which is indicated in figure by the dot, mass, dot dashed line. And again, from models produced by um, direct uh, dissipation that's collapsed, so no, no hydrodynamics, no gas, just uh, point particles for both uh, dark and baryonic matter, uh, at least in the range of uh, mass ratios mm, studied in uh, Sonnenfeld and collaborators, which ends here, points are around the, 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 mm, the relation, but they have an enormous scatter. So again, it's something uh, not really convincing. So, so this is simply the intrinsic, uh, so not uh, re-derived from a projected uh, 2D ellipticity. It's the intrinsic ellipticity as a function of the ma total mass to stellar mass um, ratio for uh, simulations with uh, live and frozen halo in spherical and clumpy, with, with sphere starting from spherical and clumpy uh, initial conditions. So for the unphysical uh, frozen halo models, there is an increasing trend between the two that is far from being linear and it saturates. But uh, for mass ratios larger than five, we even exceed the limit uh, flattening uh, or corresponding to an E7 galaxy. So all these models here for large M dot over M stars are to be taken as unphysical. Uh, extension. One well, of the interesting things, if you consider a live halo, so both uh, so both the, the initially near halo and the cold 
embryonic components are uh, allowed uh, to evolve, this uh, relation has a markedly non-monosonic trend. So it increases between one and five, between ratios one and five, and then drops systematically as uh, m over m star increases. While for a clumpy system, in the case of um, in the case of live alus, the situation is a bit more complicated. It looks like rather flat with uh, with a few outliers, at least for macerations larger than than five. And this is also pretty robust with respect to the fraction of the um, Lagrangian radii, radii enclosing 70%, 90%, or 50% of the mass. So the two sets of points, empty or filled circle, refer to different uh, Lagrangian radii within which the, the quantities are computed. So again, it looks like at least for a certain for a certain interval of mass, there's an increasing increase in trend of the ellipticity of the flattening with. Um, with the mass ratio, but the story, at least if one considers a picture with only dissipation as collapse, is more uh, complex. I mean, going a bit to systems in uh, in Mond where no dark matter is present, but all the force field uh, it's due to uh, the the, 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 the ionic component. Uh, again, um, clumpy initial condition produce a rather flat relation between the final ellipticity and uh, the, the mass ratio with a few outliers for low values of M over N star. While for a uh, model starting with uh, initial condition with, with a spherical symmetry, there's an increasing trend at first, which is not linear, and then a sudden drop at larger uh, M over over M star, and um, so this is actually reminiscent of something that is also observed in uh, in real galaxies. For example, if you think again at the relation that I told you when, at the at the beginning, so the more mass, the, the more the object is dark matter dominated, and in the line, uh, how much time do I have? Sorry. Uh, Eight. Eight. Okay, so uh, the, the more the model is dark matter dominated, or in the language of Mond, the more the system is in the deep Mond regime, the flatter uh, the flatter it should uh, it should be. But here it's not the case because we see that again the the, the electricity flattens for goes down for uh, for uh, models that are that would be dominated by dark matter in, um, in lambda CDM, but are in the deep Mond regime. In uh, in Mond, and this is actually reminiscent of what actually observes because galaxies, for as for example, the ultra faints are rather are rather spherical. They are dark matter dominated and almost fooled in the deep Mond regime in Mond, and therefore they fall outside the proposed uh, empirical relation between uh, the two. So. Uh, these are other simulations in Mond, in where instead of varying k, I fix k, and I just vary the initial um, the initial uh, viral ratio. So I obtain so here an almost linear um, relation between the total mass versus m star is recovered uh, at different at variance with what one would obtain with a similar uh, simulations in Newton, but instead of varying how much the initial condition is far in the deep Mond regime or almost Newtonian, instead of varying this, we keep this k parameter 1, but we vary the initial period ratio between 0 and 0 0.4. And here we can recover an almost linear relation, but with a different with a different slope than what observed uh, by their and collaborators. So I am um, I do have uh, a few more slides. I skipped this. This is just density profiles. I'm also mm, investigating the relation with uh, the final anisotropy of the of the models, the, the, the ratio between twice the uh, kinetic energy radial motion over the kinetic energy in the tangential uh, in tangential motion as a function of uh, um, uh, the mass ratio and uh, the uh, the ellipticity and ellipticity and it turns out that the more uh, the model is flattened the higher uh, is its um, 
amount of uh, anisotropy within uh, the half mass, uh, the half mass radius. This is for the end state. And here, as a comparison, I have the same points, but in the um, C over A versus B over A plane. So the minimum to the uh, to maximum semi-axis over the intermediate to maximum semi-axis. And mm, it turns out that actually a lot of system in both MOND and uh, uh, Newtonian gravity, they are uh, in um, they are slightly triaxial or even prolate, for example, for uh, MOND system. So therefore, this would actually um, damage uh, what one would infer assuming that the models are oblate. OK, so this was pretty much uh, the last thing I wanted to show. So I have other, uh, I have other few things that I can jump directly uh, directly to my conclusions. Oh, I have five minutes. Oh, OK, OK. I, I, thought, I thought you were saying one minute. OK, so, uh, so here is simply, is simply the evolution of uh, the semi-axis and here the, the um, uh, anisotropy parameter. And how do I, how do we interpret, uh, how do we interpret all of this? So I essentially interpret this behavior, which seems to appear as a consequence of um, dissipationless collapse, but not with uh, the correct, say, exponents that is uh, inferred from the observation. I we interpret it as a consequence of the process of radial orbit uh, instability during the first stages of, uh, of the collapse. So the stronger is the initial amount of anisotropy uh, of, the, of the system after the first one or two uh, infalls and re-expansions. The higher uh, is the chance that the system would be subjected to uh, the process of the dynamical, uh, oh, the dynamical process of radial orbit instability that essentially turns into a triaxial or flattened uh, object, something that was originally spherical but with um, uh, radially biased uh, velocity distribution. And of course, the stronger is the amount of the preformed. Uh, the, the, pre the stronger is the contribution to the potential or due to the preformed uh, dark halo, the stronger is the collapse, and therefore the higher is the chance that we have a radially biased initial velocity distribution, and the, highest is the, and the higher is the effect of uh, radial orbit uh, instability. And this is also uh, quite in agreement with uh, the radial orbit instability in modified Newtonian dynamics, where models typically can attain a larger degree of uh, orbital anisotropy and fixed uh, density profile and anisotropy radius. And they also have a stronger, they're more prone to radial orbit instability. So this brings me to the conclusions. This is just a summary of uh, my talk. So as a consequence of simple um, dissipation that's collapse, we recover a relation which is similar, but not exactly what is observed. And uh, uh, in both Newtonian and uh, Mond's, Mond system interpret, interpret as Newtonian system plus dark matter. But so far, the, the observed linear trend is not recovered. Initial anisotropy seems to play quite a, quite a big role in determining the, the final ellipticity versus dynamical mass to uh, stellar mass relation. And uh, this, in the context of MOND, maybe implies a mass anisotropy flattening relation rather than a mass uh, anisotropy flattening relation. Of course, uh, since the, since the, the, uh, of the, the, the relation observed, uh, obtained by the observer, it's in a very narrow, it's in a very narrow range of mass ratios and total mass of the system, this is not in contradiction with the fact that we have dark matter or deep mon models that are not, not flat at all, as the aforementioned uh, galaxies. And in addition, I mean, given the non-monotonic trend of the, of the ellipticity versus uh, mass ratio relation, if you go to very high, uh, 
ratios. So this is not really a contradiction with that. So that was pretty much my take on message. And I conclude here and I take questions. <laughs> Okay, thanks. Uh, and other questions for the speaker? So, um, did you try to, um, to see if there is any possibility to constrain on a self interacting Armata using uh, the evidence of the mass uh, increasing in correlation? And uh, our question is related to the clamping Armata. We assume any sub mass function in distributing the clamps, the original clamps, or just uh, Okay, so the first one, so the first one, I'm familiar with the implications of self-interacting dot matter, for example, with respect to the cork cast problem. This has also been proposed as a, as a way to get rid of the cork cast problem. Uh, well, not not in this work, but would certainly be an interesting thing to explore next. And con concerning the the initial conditions, when I am implementing Clumpy initial conditions. I typically, I typically take a virialized spherical halo, and then the baryonic component is just uh, given, uh, generating a Poissonian distribution of centers. Around these centers, I construct uh, gamma models with different gammas, and uh, I just assign uh, a position-independent uh, Maxwellian velocity distribution, which I renormalize to obtain the wanted value of. Uh, Period ratio. So no, I do not. Uh, I'm not. Uh, I'm not implementing subhalos. Which would be an interesting thing to to explore. So these are all single core simulation with ten to the six particles at maximum. So I'm don't, I didn't put enough resolution to to model uh, subhalos. Well, concerning concerning self interacting dark matter, I don't know. <laughs> I would say. Yes, this is a very short comment. <coughs> we already discussed Pierre Francesco about this, but I think it's important also for students that their proposal should be re recalled to the audience. That is another attempt to avoid the, the, the existence of dark matter. And unfortunately, as almost all these proposals failed, failed Fails dramatically. When confronted with observations, not with the simulations. For example, we have the, the proposal that the dark matter is just an effect of rotation in general relativity. And this is proved wrong empirically because we see dark matter in non rotating systems. In this proposal, you expect no dark matter in spherical system. The first systems in the history of astronomy where dark matter was detected clusters. were clusters of galaxies. Plenty of dark matter. They are not flat like these in galaxies. So this should be enough. Maybe dark matter is not existent, but certainly all these proposals fail miserably with observations, with not, not with the So, in other words, maybe you can obtain some correlation between the dark matter and flame. This is not a contradiction. The contradiction with the theory is that we see dark matter in spherical systems. And there is no answer to this. Uh, yes, so in fact, in fact this, actually, this the... a comment not about your work, but just to put in some perspective all these different attempts that usually they, they, they just uh, work for a very specific. single specific problem. And they are, but if you put them in a context of astronomy, that they are out of nine over ten observations. Yeah, this I think is the yeah. In fact, to stress, I mean, to stress even more, yeah. when I showed, uh, let me go back, when I showed uh, this, you know, Plot here. Now here you have you see clearly you know you you have system where you have a lot of dark matter that are more way more round than system with yeah. less dark matter, for example. So this is when you also have a live halo. So both, the, I mean, dark and luminous matter talk to each other via gravity, and it's not just an external potential. Yeah. Uh, 
so maybe it, more of an observational question, but did anyone try to explain the absurd effect with the uh, uh, stellar population trends with ellipticity? Because what is actually measured is the mass to life ratio. So what if, uh, uh, this, for example, the stellar ages have a systematic trend with ellipticity of a galaxy? That would not be crazy to think about that, you know, like in terms of evolution. Then you could have different uh, uh, mass to life ratios of the stellar populations. And it appears to me that here they don't try to estimate the stellar so mass. They didn't. they didn't. So far, I haven't found any more recent work. Perhaps, perhaps they're doing, but it seems, I mean, it also seems reasonable to me. I mean, maybe they have a uh, distribution bias and angular bias. And so if you observe a given population, you observe, you, you think that the system is flatter around uh, than uh, what it is intrinsic. Yeah, makes sense. But so far, to, to my knowledge, there's no, no such a thing. Uh, a simple question to, to just understand better. Um, so when you test the Newtonian case here, this is meant to be some sort of hierarchical scenario, but it cannot be fully because you don't have continuous addition. So test is some sort of monolithical. Yes, monolithical or local collapse of smaller substructures that then via dynamical friction they merge with uh, central heavier clump yeah, this, these are isolated isolated simulation I mean, no cosmological context is the fact that a newtonian scenario maybe cannot reproduce exactly reality is a proof that the hierarchical model is wrong as well or depends on the setup here i guess it depends on the setup well, Mond, for example, would be more uh, higher art, more, sorry, more monolithic than, uh, than, uh, than Newtonian gravity. But, you know, in, in a way, there are two monolithic approximations of a uh, formation of a single object without assuming any cosmological things. And on top of that, it's because most part of the observed sample refers to isolated galaxies and not to galaxies in group or even worse in clusters, in galaxy clusters. So that's the reason behind Jim and choosing some uh, isolated objects. Okay, I don't see other questions from the remote audience. Okay. Unless there are other questions here, we can thank the speaker. <laughs> And we move to the second door. Okay. So